My name is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Um, thank you all for being here. A special thanks to the Chancellor, John Dunn, who's just come off a an amazing weekend of running from event to event and also I gave him assurances that he wouldn't have to speak tonight. I think his, his throat is sore and he's exhausted, but let's thank John Dunn for being here. As many of you know, this is wrapping up our fall session of, uh, of speakers and I really couldn't think of a better person to help us think about Washington and Illinois politics than Ray LaHood. Ray, as you know, has been a wise man of American politics and Illinois politics for a number of years, was a congressman from the district outside of Peoria, had, of course, the transportation secretary. I must say, in a spirit of full disclosure, I should note that I've known Ray for a long time. In fact, I've known him since eighth grade. <laughs> And I can date it that precisely because he was my eighth grade teacher in Peoria at Holy Family School. That was a few years ago, and my classmates and I like to take full credit for Ray's subsequent successes. We think that <laughs> we helped mold his character trying to put uh, sometimes obtuse 10 year olds uh, uh, under control. But, but Ray and I have, have known each other over the years. Our paths have crossed a number of times. When I moved to uh, Springfield, one of my first jobs, I was working in the, the General Assembly as a legislative liaison, and Ray at the time was a state representative from the Quad Cities. I then moved to D.C. and came, met Ray in a couple contexts. He was chief of staff to Bob Michael, uh, who we'll talk about a lot, um, congressman from Peoria for a number of years, and then, of course, transportation secretary. I have to tell one kind of quick funny story. My wife was uh, used Ray LaHood to get a job once. She was interviewing for a job at C-SPAN. And she's not a huge political junkie, but one of the, one of the parts of this interview was they said, okay, we're gonna name a person and tell what department they work in. So Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, Bob Gates, Secretary of Defense. Then they said Ray LaHood. And she, she wasn't quite sure if it was transportation or commerce. She said, well, he was my husband's eighth grade teacher. They said, okay, <laughs> that counts and you got the job. So uh, she's been very grateful to Ray for that. Um, what I thought we might do to, to kind of structure this talk is to, to talk a little bit about you know, Ray's book. He's written a really remarkable memoir called Seeking Bipartisanship. Uh, to talk a little bit about his life story, but also to talk about, of course, events in Washington and all that's happening in Washington, and also Springfield, because this is a new time in Springfield. So I have some questions, Ray, but I didn't, do, did you want to say something well, to start first, out? First of all, thank uh, all of you for being here, and uh, uh, special uh, thanks to uh, Sheila and her husband for being here. Paul Simon was a dear, dear friend of mine. I served uh, with him uh, as a member of the, the U.S. House from the 18th District, and he was our senator then, and uh, he and I became very good friends. Um, and he got me involved in a program in Washington, D.C. called Everybody Wins. This is a reading program, a reading mentoring program, and our delegation would get together once a month, sometimes in, uh, on the Senate side, in Senator Simon's office, or on the House side. And um, at one of those meetings, Senator Simon said to all of us in the delegation, I want each of you to think about uh, getting involved in a reading program that I've been involved with, where you go to a school on Tuesday and have lunch with a student and the two of you get to know one another and you become a mentor and you read to one another. And I, I did that at John Tyler School for the 14 years that I was in Congress. And I wouldn't have done that had Senator Simon not uh, really uh, asked us to, to look at that. It's a wonderful program. It's a great mentoring program. Uh, and I always remember the other thing that Senator Simon said about this. Even though we're part-time here in Washington, we owe it to the Washington, D.C. community to give something back. And Senator Simon surely did that. And my involvement in that program 
uh, made me feel like I was giving back also. So uh, that's, that's one of many stories. Senator Simon and I served on the uh, Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission together and really planned uh, a number of events. And uh, so I, I only have wonderful fond memories of Paul Simon. And uh, I've been here once before when Mike Lawrence was uh, the director and uh, came back today at Jack's invitation. And I had forgotten that when, when I went into the Institute offices today, there's a list of people who had made contributions, significant contributions, and my name is on there. <laughs> and when I retired from Congress, I had a significant amount of campaign money left. And one of the first people to call me uh, was, uh, <laughs> was uh, Mike Lawrence and said, hey, we need some of that money down here. And so I'm, I, I'd forgotten that I'd even made a contribution. But so to all of you who've continued to make a contribution, to the Paul Simon uh, Institute. Thank you for that. This is important, uh, not, not necessarily this gathering, but the idea of continuing his legacy of the importance of bipartisanship, but uh, his legacy of, of work uh, in so many different areas. So Jack, thank you for inviting me. Great. And thank you all for being here. Well, Ray, uh, let's talk just a little bit to kind of ground people on your career, because you, uh, in your book, you write, I was not born into politics. Tell us a little bit about your family and, and how you made your first foray well, I, into politics. I think that uh, people think that when you're involved in politics that maybe you come from a political family, and I certainly did not. Um, I, I grew up in a family where my father went to two years of high school, didn't graduate from high school, was a restaurateur, uh, worked in his own restaurant for 25 years, worked hard every day, 12 hours a day. And, um, and, and we grew up in a neighborhood, a very uh, middle class, to lower middle class neighborhood in Peoria. And um, I had a, a wonderful childhood. But I always wanted, always aspired to be a teacher. Uh, because of the teachers that I had, uh, i.e., I, I ended up uh, probably being one of the best teachers that Jack Shaw ever had. <laughs> All of his success is directly attributable to my eighth grade education that I gave him. And um, I taught school for six years. While I was teaching people like Jack the Constitution, I got interested in politics. When I was growing up in Peoria, I couldn't have told you who the mayor was, who my congressperson was. I, I didn't know any of that about politics. But as I began to teach people like Jack and my other students about government, about the Constitution, I became uh, interested in politics. I worked for two congressmen, uh, Tom Railsback from the Quad City area for five and a half years. And then um, I worked for Bob Michael for 12 years, 17 and a half years as a congressional staffer. And then when Bob Michael retired, I obviously ran, ran for the seat and had the good fortune of being elected and was able to serve with good people like Senator Simon, Senator Dixon, and, and, uh, and many other good people. Let's talk about Bob Michael. In fact, I was this weekend watched a, a, an interesting show on book TV in which Ray and several other people uh, talked about a, a new book that's been, come out of, on about Bob Michael. And he's someone that was a, a legendary figure in many respects, and maybe for students ha don't know that much about him. So provide sort of a sketch of Bob Michael and also how he, what he was like as a boss and how he shaped your career. Well, Bob Michael was the congressman from the 18th Congressional District for 38 years. Always served in the minority. Became Republican leader in 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected president. Longest serving Republican leader of the U.S. House from Illinois, always very proud to have been from Peoria and, uh, and, and served with great distinction uh, in the sense that he rose to a position of leadership uh, in the U.S. Congress. While he was leader with Reagan for eight years, they were able to pass a lot of legislation. And Reagan gets credit for passing a lot of good legislation even with a Democratic Congress, and I give Michael the credit for that on the sense that he had built relationships on both sides of the aisle that he was able to reach across the aisle, get Democrats to support 
some of Reagan's most important legislation. And he was responsible during the Clinton uh, time for passage of NAFTA. And uh, so because of the relationships that he built in a bipartisan way. The interesting thing about the 18th district is this. Abraham Lincoln represented nine counties for one term. And we're very proud of that. And that's something that I always talked about. Everett Dirksen was the congressman from the 18th district who went on to run for the Senate and become Senate Minority Leader and helped Lyndon Johnson pass the Civil Rights Bill as the Republican leader in the United States Senate. Bob Michael serves 38 years, helps Reagan and Clinton as Republican leader pass major legislation. My point in telling you this is we've had good, strong leadership from central Illinois, and it's all been in a bipartisan way in working on both sides of the aisle. And, uh, and, and so uh, Michael really set a, a very high bar, and uh, we tried to continue it during our time, uh, 14 years. And uh, now uh, our son, uh, Darren, is the congressman from uh, the 18th district and uh, is continuing that, that legacy of bipartisanship. Michael came into the sort of the modern reality with a battle with Newt Gingrich. Right. To, to tell people about, I mean, they're almost polar opposites in their approach to politics. Yeah. And many people see the, the retirement of Bob Michael and the ascension of Newt Gingrich as speaker as a pivot point in both American politics and in the modern Republican Party. Yeah, the thing about Gingrich is, uh, if you look at his political history. He ran for Congress three times before he was elected. Very, very committed uh, conservative. It took him three times to get elected to the U.S. House. When he did get elected, he served throughout Ronald Reagan's eight years and was really a Reagan acolyte, believed in many of the things that Reagan believed in and supported many of them. But it was clear that Newt did not like being in the minority. And it was clear that he would do anything that he could to gain the majority and become speaker. And uh, over time, uh, he was able to, uh, the, during a, a period, Jim Wright from Texas was the speaker. Gingrich figured out a way to sort of run him out of office. And uh, Newt eventually became the number two in the House under Michael. It's called the Republican Whip, and um, he, he won that race with one vote and uh, became Whip, and then when Bob announced his retirement in 1994 that he wasn't going to run again for Congress from the 18th District, uh, Newt ran a national campaign around the idea of the contract with America, 10 items. We'll vote on these 10 items within the first 100 days. Every congressman, except for three, including me, signed, every candidate signed the contract with America, ran on that, and uh, Newt nationalized the congressional elections in 1994, and ultimately Republicans took control uh, after being out for 40 years. And, uh, and, and Newt became speaker, and, uh, and, and he, he did it by... Uh, really using techniques that uh, traditionally had not been used by Republican leadership. In your book, you say that your career was fundamentally changed by the fact that you didn't sign the contract and you felt like the Gingrich never really saw you as part of the team and that that... Well, yeah, that's true. I think uh, I was one of three people who didn't sign the contract with America. During my time as chief of staff for Bob Michael, I got to know Newt. I watched him in meetings. I attended a lot of meetings. I thought the contract with America was a little too gimmicky for me, and I wanted to maintain some independence. My congressional district was a district, as I said, Abraham Lincoln, Everett Dirksen, uh, people who, each of who had a little bit of an independent streak. Uh, and I wanted to kind of maintain that, and, uh, and, and I was able to do that, although I was not looked upon by leadership, having not signed the contract with with uh, maybe much favor in the beginning, but in the end, 
you know, uh, it, it, it worked out fine. One of the initiatives that you were probably most known for was the civility effort. Describe both the inspiration behind it and how it was manifested in the various... In 1995, we came into the majority. Gingrich becomes speaker. Most Democrats despised Gingrich because they knew that he ran Jim Wright out of office as speaker. They knew that he used uh, a national election to become speaker and elect all these Republicans. Uh, and they didn't like his techniques, they didn't like his philosophy. And some Democrats approached me about the idea of how do we really get back to this idea of working together? And, and so we came up with the idea of bipartisan retreats, of which we had four. And what we did is we got members of Congress and their spouses and their children to spend a weekend together, and we organize these weekend retreats with the idea that if you get to know somebody in politics, very difficult to criticize them, very difficult to be negative with them. And, and in years past, people like Paul Simon, Alan Dixon, knew the delegation, knew their families, knew their spouses, and frankly, in 1995, when people were elected, none of these members, many of them had no experience in a legislative body. Their families had not met one another. They had spent no time together. But once people began to gather together at these bipartisan retreats, first time a congressional spouse met another congressional spouse, first time a congressional kid met another congressional kid. And the point I want to make here is, all of you who live in the communities around here, all of you who volunteer on the school board, the, the library board, the, uh, the church board, you work together, you know one another, you may not always agree, but in the end, you come to consensus. And that's the kind of experience we were trying to develop. When people get to know one another, and in the old days in Congress, members of Congress knew one another. The families knew one another. The kids knew one another. And it's very difficult to butt heads with people when you know them and you have a personal relationship. You can still stand on your principles and you can still have your differences, but compromise then does not become a bad word. Compromise is the way for 240 years we've solved our problems in America. And all of a sudden, compromise became a bad word and these bipartisan retreats, we had four of them over a period of about six years. Members really got to know one another. Families got to know one another. And in the end, during that period, Gingrich as speaker, Clinton as president, we passed three balanced budgets, welfare reform, two transportation bills, myriad of legislation. Why? Because people understood what their jobs were. Not to always agree, but once in a while compromise. Clinton had voted that welfare bill twice, but he and Gingrich knew their job was to get things done. And after people got to know one another, became better acquainted, they understood what their responsibilities were. I remember bumping into you in the Capitol. This was maybe in 2006 where you had decided not to run for re-election. And I said, so what's next? What are you going to do? And you said, this was maybe September, October of 2006. And you said, I have no idea. Right. Well, fate intervened. Barack Obama won the presidency. And you knew him from the Illinois congressional delegation. And you also had a very close relationship with his chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel. So tell a little bit of the story about how you became the only Republican in the uh, President Obama's cabinet. One of the friends that I really made, became close to during our time in Congress was Rahm Emanuel, who was a congressman from Chicago, ultimately, obviously, became chief of staff for then President Obama and went on to become mayor for eight years in Chicago. Rahm and I became friends around some legislative issues, child health care, and some other issues. And I was on the Appropriations Committee, and he would come to me from time to time and say, hey, we've got this project in Chicago. Could you help us get some money for this or that project? And so we became friends. 
And the other thing that we did, he and I initially would go out to dinner with one another maybe once a month. Then we came up with the idea where he would invite six or seven Democrats, I would invite six or seven Republicans, we'd go to a restaurant near Capitol Hill, and we'd have dinner together, and people would get to know one another. And so Ram and I became very, very good friends. And when President o when Senator Obama won the United States Senate race, I had never met him. Never met him throughout the campaign. But three days after his election to the United States Senate from Illinois, my cell phone rings and it's Barack Obama. He said, Ray, this is Barack Obama. Obviously, I said, congratulations. He said, I'm coming to Peoria and I'd like to visit with you about how we can work together. He came to my district office, my congressional office in Peoria. We met for 90 minutes, and for two years we worked together. He opened an office in Springfield, which was in my district. He opened a Senate office. I went to the opening of his office. I think people were astounded that I showed up there. He and I worked together for two years on issues for Illinois. And when he was running for president, I ran into him in the Capitol. And he asked me, I had already announced my retirement. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I really don't know. And he said, well, look, if this thing works out for me, I may be looking for a few Republicans to serve in my administration. And you know, to be honest with you, I didn't think much of it. I, I mean, <laughs> because I, at that point, I had no idea he was going to get elected president. And um, a few days after he was elected president, Ram and I talked. I was invited to come to Chicago on a very cold day in December, and uh, I had no idea when I went for the interview with then President-elect Obama if um, there would be one person in the room, him, or 50 people, but when I went there, it was just uh, President-elect Obama. We talked for 40 minutes. A week later, he had Rom call me and say, uh, President-elect Obama would like you to become Secretary of Transportation. I didn't even think of it for more than one second. I said, of course I will, because I believed this was an opportunity to continue my public service, very selfish, but also to work for the most historic president ever elected in the 240-year history of our country, the first African-American president from Illinois. So for me, it was, you know, it was a no-brainer, and, uh, and we had a lot of fun for four and a half years. Well, tell us about uh, Barack Obama up close, because I used to see pictures of you uh, at the golf course with him, and I was thinking, okay, a kid from Peoria golfing with the President of the United States. If he has a bad shot, what do you do? Do you look away, well, or do you, uh, you know, tease uh, him? Or, I mean, just tell I, us a little bit about the Barack yeah, Obama up close. Yeah, I, you know, we, we had a friendship, and we were both from Illinois, and we, we, you know, we had a connection. And, and the advantage for me really was is that I really knew President Obama, maybe like unlike, unlike any other cabinet member, except, you know, obviously he and Hillary had run against one another, but we had a real friendship going into the administration. And so from time to time, he would invite me to play golf. Uh, he invited my wife and I to a number of social events at the at the White House and so forth, but um, uh, we developed a, a real friendship, even to the extent that, you know, we try and get together at least once, we've tried to get together at least once a year since, uh, since he left office, and, uh, and, and so uh, we, we've continued to have a very, very uh, strong friendship. And in a sense, um, we're different generations. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously older, and, but it, it the fact that we were both from Illinois, we both came up in politics, uh, we, we both had this sort of bipartisan streak about us that we knew that in order to get things done, uh, we, we needed, you know, people from both parties. He really believed in that. And, uh, and uh, obviously I'm an example of it, and uh, so we, we still have a very, very strong friendship. In your book, you, you write of Joe Biden as having a real bipartisan uh, aspect to him. Tell us a little bit about yeah. Biden. You know, Vice President Biden was put in charge by, within 30 days of President Obama uh, being elected, 
he signed the stimulus bill, $870 billion, of which $48 billion came to DOT to put people to work on roads, bridges, transit, and so forth. And President Obama asked Vice President Biden to lead that transition of that money. And so I worked very closely with Vice President Biden. Uh, and um, he and I have become very good friends. Uh, I'm not even bashful about saying that I've already sent him two contributions for his presidential. When he announced, I sent him a contribution. And I've sent him another one uh, since then, and uh, uh, because I think he'd be a, a, a really good president. I think he would surround himself uh, with good people, and uh, uh, you know, Lord knows that's what we need right now. But I, I'm, I'm sorry to make this kind of a campaign thing, because I know there's probably people in here that are from... I, I'm a Republican, by the way. I still am. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the reasons I am is, in Illinois, as you know, in order to qualify for a party, you have to vote in the primary. And my son would kill me if I went in and <laughs> pulled a Democratic ballot, so I have to uh, pull a... But, but look, I've been a Republican all my life. I wouldn't have gotten in the Obama cabinet if I hadn't been a Republican, so I'm not going to give it up now. But I care, I care enough about the country to know that... W anyway, we need, we, we need some new leadership. Uh -huh. Well, that's where I was going to head, uh, to current circumstances. And again, I know your son's a congressman, and, but, but um, how do you see this current moment in terms of you, you lived through the Clinton impeachment, you presided over good chunks of it in the House. What do you see happening in the next 90 days um, in the well, House I think, specifically? I think that, uh, I think that look, impeachment is, is a political decision. Say what you want to. You go back and read the history of Andrew Johnson, who was the first president to be impeached. He wasn't convicted, but he was impeached. He was, he was Lincoln's vice president, became president, got into big dispute with the Congress, and Congress decided to impeach him. That was a political decision. When Bill Clinton was impeached by the House, which I served in, that was a political decision by Speaker Gingrich, to impeach the president. Speaker Pelosi has made a decision. Now, you, you can say what you want based on whatever. Impeachment is a political decision. My, what I've said is, I think it's a complete waste of time because in a Republican Senate where you have to get 68 votes for conviction, it's not going to happen. Mitch McConnell will never, ever let it happen. Now, he, he's required, if the House impeaches President Trump, he's required to take it up. And just, Chief Justice Roberts will have to preside. But there's no way, with 48 Democrats and 53 Republicans, I'm sorry, 47 and 53, that the Senate will ever get 68 votes to convict. And here we are. We need immigration reform. We need a transportation bill to fix up all the potholes in America. We, we need to fix our fiscal mess where we have a $20 trillion debt. We need a new NAFTA if that's the direction the Congress is going to help our farmers out. We need markets. We need to straighten out the mess we have with our friends in the, in, in the rest of the world. But. There's going to be a lot of time and energy spent over the next 90 days on impeachment. And I believe Speaker Pelosi has made the decision. I believe they'll have the votes. And I believe it's a big waste of time for America. I really do. How do you think this impeachment... And let me just say this. The, the Democrats who... The, the, and I was there during the Clinton impeachment. The Democrats who made the argument that we should not be impeaching Bill Clinton are the same Democrats now that are saying we should impeach President Trump. They are. It's like Groundhog Day, only with opposite parties. Go ahead. OK. Um, so how do you think this impeachment effort will shape the contours of the 2020 uh, 
I don't know. Landscape. Um, well, let me just play the, the, off this idea. It seemed to me that Pelosi this summer had made a political decision not to go for impeachment. You know, the way that they went dark for five, six weeks. Right. It seemed to me clear that if she was serious about impeachment, that she would have held hearings. She would have got, you know, she would have created enough noise in Washington. She clearly didn't. And it seemed like for her, the triggering point was this Ukrainian exchange in which she just felt it seems to me that she really did not have, that there was simply no way she could not go forward uh, by not tr doing the impeachment route. Do you think oh, that's I a fair? Think, I think that's right. I, I, think that, I think that is a decision that she's made. I, I think some of her members felt that she could have uh, allowed impeachment articles based on the Mueller report. There were a lot of members that felt that way and introduced articles of impeachment. But that was not the breaking point for her. Obviously, this Ukrainian thing was. And uh, I, I, to me, I, I, haven't, you know, I haven't read the transcript of the phone call or any of that. Uh, but people that have believe that, you know, maybe there'll be articles of impeachment about that. I think there'll also be articles of impeachment having to do with the Mueller report, too, because that's what some of her members want. Would it be better for the Republican Party if Donald Trump is defeated in 2020 in terms of being able to return back to a party of Bob Dole and Bob uh, Michael? Or Look, the party will never go back to the party of, of Bob Dole, Bob Michael, Ronald Reagan. The party's been transformed. And it depends on who takes the party over when Trump is gone. And, and eventually Trump will be gone one way or another. And whether a more traditional type of Republican comes in to, to fill that void, it, it, nobody really knows. But for those of you that are Republicans that don't like the image of the Republican Party now, when Trump is gone, somebody else will come and take over the party the way that Trump has taken over the party. Now, think of this on the Democratic side. And again, I'm not a Democrat, but think of this idea. The Democratic Party has been transformed. The last election transformed the Democratic Party, electing 100 women. And you look at the two leading candidates. Well, Biden is leading, but look who's moving up. Elizabeth Warren. Bernie was until his illness. The Democratic Party is moving left. The Republican Party is in the hands of Trump. My point is this. These things change. They ebb and flow. But the Republican Party is not the Ronald Reagan Party. There's, there's not, not even a glimmer of the Ronald Reagan Party. It's the Trump Party. He's taken over the party, but he'll be gone. And we'll see what happens. I don't, nobody knows the answer to that, because nobody knows Who's going to come riding in on a white or dark horse? Well, let me ask you one question about Illinois, and then we're going to open it up to the audience here to, to talk. But give us your take on where we are in Illinois. We have a new governor who's come in after four pretty tough, contentious years. How do you see the landscape in Illinois politically? I think, and I, I mentioned this to the acting chancellor and uh, a few other people. I, I am, I, I'm really sad at, and I know many of you in this room are too, at, at the way that, you know, Bogoyevich and Rauner really uh, didn't really pay attention to our great university system in Illinois. It, it's a tragedy. And I, I really give Pritzker credit on this. I think he has a vision to restore Southern Illinois University, the University of Illinois, Eastern Illinois, Western Illinois is just decimated. They have a new president there. They've been decimated because of a lack of leadership and a lack of vision from the governor, previous governors who didn't care two hoots about the university system. And Prisker does. So I like that. I like the fact that Prisker passed in a bipartisan way with the Republican leader in the Senate and the Republican leader in the House a capital bill. Now, some of you in this room may not like the idea of a 19-cent increase in the gas tax. I get that. But our roads are going to get fixed up. 
We're not going to wait for Washington. Our bridges are going to get repaired. We're not going to wait for Washington. And I like the idea that Prisker stepped up and said, nobody likes a tax increase. But if you want to fix up your roads and bridges, you've got to have money. And he got the Republican leader in the Senate, Bill Brady, and the Republican leader in the House, Jim Durkin. He could have passed these bills with all Democrats. He didn't need any Republicans, but he knew that on issues like transportation and education, these are bipartisan issues. These affect all the citizens of Illinois. I like Prisker's leadership on these matters. I really do. And, um, and so I, I think we're in a much better place. I think SIU is in a much better place. You got a governor who cares about SIU and Western and Eastern and University of Illinois and the schools in Chicago. And uh, that, that, that was very disappointing with, with our previous uh, governors. And uh, so I think, I think we're on track. But the politics of how the governor is elected, uh, that part I don't like. And here's what I mean by that. Back in the day when Jim Thompson was elected, Jim Edgar was elected, I'm not saying they were common, ordinary citizens. They weren't billionaires. It seems as though now in Illinois, common, ordinary people without much means, it's going to be very hard to get elected. Governor, maybe even to some of these other positions. And, and here's the definition of what I mean. Pritzker, and you remember what I said about him. I've been complimenting him. He spent $240 million of his own money. And Rauner spent $100 million. Now, how, somebody who cares about state government, how are they ever going to get elected governor? They're not. Jim Edgar and Jim Thompson could not get elected governor because they're not billionaires in today's environment. I don't like that about politics. I think there's too much money in politics. I don't, look at, that's the problem. Uh, we, we need to figure out a solution to that so that citizens from all over the state that want to become involved in politics don't have to be a billionaire to do it. That part I don't like. Great. Well, Ray, I could ask you many other questions, but I know there's plenty of people out there who have questions of Ray LaHood. So why don't you just uh, raise your hand, and I think we'll get microphones to you uh, quickly. So. Um, Bradley's heading right there. Oh, okay. Uh, I've been kind of concerned about the candidates for president, the age. You have to be at least 35 to run for president, but there's no maximum. It's, I think it's a really hard job. And I'm not sure. I thought Ronald Reagan was too old. I think Donald Trump is too old. What is your perspective from Washington about a geriatric person running for such a difficult you know, job. I, I, don't, I don't hear much debate. I mean, I hear people say, you know, if, if Biden were to get elected, he's going to be, you know, in his late 70s. And if Bernie gets elected, he's going to be in, in his late 70s. And um, um, to be honest with you, I don't think it's a big concern for the American people. I really don't. And to be honest with you, there aren't a lot of young people running right now. Trump is in his 70s. And the, the major candidates that are at the top of the, the so-called, you know, there, there are some. But you, you don't have a person like the age of Obama or Kennedy or someone like that. And so. I don't, I don't hear a lot of debate about it. To be honest with you, I don't have a lot of angst about that. Um, I think we're going to kind of know a little bit about that uh, when we see how Bernie continues to do. Because, you know, he's, he, he just had a heart attack. And we're going to see if that matters to Democrats or not, whether he continues to raise the money and stay pretty much on top, 
along with Biden and Elizabeth Warren. I think if he continues to fall, then maybe people are going to say, we should be concerned about the age and the health of these people. I think that, that'll be kind of a barometer. Great. Other questions? There's a gentleman. Uh, my boss. <clears throat> You spoke about uh, bipartisan civility, right? And one of my concerns right now is the position of policy uh, between right and left. And my question to you would be, in a world uh, where one side is proposing policy based on violence, such as cage the immigrant or starve the poor, maybe that's my personal opinion, uh, how do you think that folks from the other side that may not propose such violent policy should approach bipartisan civility? I think that we need to elect people who understand the job they're running for. And I'll just say, Congress, uh, during when I was elected in 94, there were um, 73 Republicans and maybe 13 Democrats. The majority of them had never served in public office before. Now, I'm. I think you have to elect people who understand the job they're being elected to. And if you're going to get elected to Congress, the way that Congress works, the way that Congress always has worked, if you get anything done, it has to be bipartisan. And it has to be with compromise. And if you're against those two things, then you're not going to do your job very well. I look at 10, 2010, in the middle of Obama's first term, and all these Tea Party people got elected. And they got elected on a platform of, I'm going to vote no, I don't believe in compromise, and it's my way or the highway. And they, frankly, many of them got elected. Many of them got swept out in the midterm of the Trump administration, and a new group came in. And so these are my, my feeling is you have to elect people. And if you're talking about Congress, this is a job where you legislate in a way that takes into account <coughs> excuse me, many different points of view. And in the end, compromise ends up being whatever bill gets passed. And that's the way our system works. It's the way it's always worked. You work with the White House, you work with the Senate, you work with the House, and eventually you fashion a bill. And I mentioned between 96, 97, and 99, Clinton and Newt, complete opposites philosophy. We passed a welfare reform that Clinton vetoed twice. We passed two transportation bills. We passed three balanced budgets, and, and, and a number of other things. Why? Because these two leaders, Clinton and Gingrich, knew their job was to solve the country's problems, and it can only be done with compromise. And that's a problem today. I have a question in regard to how much time can congressmen spend in Washington. You've alluded to it. It seems like during the time of Dirksen and in yesteryear, uh, they moved to Washington, and there was a lot of socializing, and they got to know each other, like you talked about. Why has that changed? Because now it seems like they only spend about three days out of the week in Washington, and the rest of the time, are they raising money? Why is it so? Why the change? What? How can that be corrected, or is that just? Times. Well, it, 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 it changed uh, when the leaders decided that they needed to help their members get reelected, so they needed to spend time in their districts. Most members of Congress, I would say 99.9%, .9 their families, at least in the House, different in the Senate, in the House, their families live in Illinois. When I was in Congress 14 years, my wife and I raised four kids. They lived in Peoria. So I would come back and forth every weekend. And that was true of almost every member of the House. Very difficult to build relationships with people. The other part of it is, when, when Congress is in session, when the House is in session, in the evenings, most members of Congress are at fundraisers for themselves. 
One of the best things that happened in Illinois is when the Illinois legislature decided that when they're in session, none of the legislators can have fundraisers. So what's that mean? It means they got to go to dinner with one another or they got to sit next to one another while they're passing bills and get to know one another. Members of the U.S. House, when they're in Washington, in the evenings, they're, they're at fundraisers. And it's just, uh, it's the system that's developed over time, and it does not lead to building relationships. Can you talk a little bit about um, the impact of the president's appointments to head up agencies um, of people who are diametrically opposed to what the agency's purpose is and uh, you know what that has done to the future of uh, state or um, people who work in the government and their desire to continue to work there. Did everybody hear the question? What, what, happens, what happens when a president appoints people to a particular agency and the person who's heading that agency up doesn't believe in the philosophy of the agency and doesn't really carry out the mandate of the agency? That, that, is, that is an occurrence that's taken place under this administration. I can tell you that never happened under the Obama administration. I was there for eight years at Bush. It never happened under the Bush administration. I was there for part of Clinton's administration. Never happened in his administration. I was a staffer for 17 and a half years. I don't know of another administration except this one. And so what happens is the staff becomes very demoralized. They begin not to like their jobs. They begin not to value themselves or the work that they do. And the classic example of it is the Consumer Protection Agency, which was signed into law by President Obama, which was legislation that Senator Warren promoted. Senator Obama signed it. President Trump put Nick Mulvaney in that job as acting, and absolutely nothing has happened. That's, I mean, that's, that's one that I know about, where nothing has happened. So what happens is, Nothing happens. The staff is demoralized. They devalue their worth. And they get what they want. Nothing. <laughs> and the American people get nothing. So uh, the Inspector General's office came out with a report that blamed Amtrak's poor on-time performance for loss of over $100 million. In fact, we here at SIU are home to the worst performing Amtrak line. Um, so as former Secretary of Transportation, I was wondering what do you believe needs to be done to fix Amtrak's woes? Well. One of the things that we did uh, when Governor Quinn was governor is we invested a lot in the Amtrak line between Chicago and, and this part of the state. And uh, billions of dollars, because we believe that the Amtrak line from Chicago to southern Illinois was a lifeline of transportation for students going to ISU in Bloomington, normal, Western Illinois University, Knox College, Southern Illinois University, and it's, it's just a very good form of transportation. Since I left DOT, Amtrak has a new CEO. He's the former CEO of Delta. His name is Richard Anderson, and his mission is eventually to try and get Amtrak to make money. I, I think this. I think when you have a line of Amtrak trains that run from north to south in a state like Illinois and provide such vital transportation to students from all over the state, 
you have to just re reconcile yourself to the fact that it may not make money, but it's an important part of the transportation system of Illinois. And if you want to make money, try and make money on lines where you can make money. Ridership is obviously a big part of it. I think it would be a terrible, terrible mistake for Amtrak to ever close down this line. I really do. And so it may take the state to step up and increase its, you know, the state provides some subsidy for uh, Amtrak, and uh, that may well be what needs to happen if they continue with this philosophy in Washington where Amtrak is located, that these lines have to make money. There are some things in transportation where you're providing a service, whether it's bus service, streetcar service, train service, that are not going to make money. But it's, a, it's valuable to institutions like SIU and to the students who use it. So part of it has to be a little bit of a philosophical change. Maybe two more questions, three questions. Oh, no, here, no, we, okay. we're, we're going to, we've got three hands up. We'll take okay. those three. Uh, your son notwithstanding, I was wondering if you'd comment on the idea of congressional term limits. I voted for congressional term limits. I think if there are term limits on the president, we surely could have term limits on Congress. These are not lifetime jobs. And, you know, if, if people in the country think term limits are a good thing, which I think a lot of people do, um, it, it, it probably, it probably not a bad thing to do. You know, maybe 12 years. Uh, people from California where they have six-year term limits for uh, California House members and six-year term limits for California, they think it's terrible because nobody can ever really gain the experience and know-how. And it, what ends up happening is uh, the governor and his staff end up running state government, and the legislators don't have much say or sway. Um, and some people argue that that could happen in Washington. Uh, but I, I think people believe that it's a good thing to term limit members of the House. And so maybe two terms for senators, that would be 12 years, and, and maybe 12 years for the House. And I, I have voted for that because uh, I think it's, you know, it, frankly what the people want. And what the people want is not always correct, but it, it, it's, uh, it's something that people have clamored for. It, it, it's probably not, not going to happen. We passed it in the House. Uh, the Senate never, has never really taken it up. couple more here. That gentleman had his hand up, and this gentleman. I grew up in a, a, a political nerd family. We, we loved talking about politics, and we loved talking about the different sides of it. You know, one liberal son, one conservative son, one liberal daughter. You know, the whole thing was great. We are probably folks in this world here right now sitting who love this kind of debate and conversation. And we are living in a world where there are people who get so angry with other folks that may disagree or not feel heard. And I just wanted maybe the, ph the philosophy of politics, if you could give us a sense of what, what that means to you is that as we're changing as families, not, not able to talk about politics. You want me to comment on that or? <laughs> Sounds like your family needs a little counseling. <laughs> I mean, look at it. All, all, all families have political debate, and uh, you know, people usually uh, get along pretty well. And um, p p let, let me answer a question that hasn't been asked, and that is, um, what, what's going to change? And let me tell you the three or four things that I think have really changed politics. Number one, there's way too much money in politics. Way too much. If you want to run for a U.S. House seat, probably costs you a mi minimum of a million dollars. 
John Shimkus is going to retire. He represents 30 counties down this way. I, I don't know how many people are going to run, but it, it's going to cost somebody a lot of money. So there's too much money in politics. I already talked about the gubernatorial aspect of that, so you know what I mean. There's way, way too much 24-7 cable news. There's five channels that broadcast 24-7. Now there's not enough news. So what happens is they rebroadcast things over and over that people start to believe it. The, the demunition the, the downgrading of newspapers in America, I think, has been terrible. I really do. In, in my hometown of Peoria, the Peoria Journal Star is like a shopper. Most people, it, it, usually on any given day, it ends up being um, 15 or 20 pages total. And four or five of those are obituaries, which is why most people read that paper. And a lot of it's advertising. There's only really three papers in America that go in depth on issues. And, and our hometown paper used to do that. But they don't do it anymore. New York Times, I'm not talking about in terms of going in depth on issues, they do it. You may not like their editorials. I'll give you that. If you're conservative, you don't. The Wall Street Journal goes in depth on issues and the Washington Post, that's it. All, I have four grown children. They read all their papers online. They, they, don't, they don't, I have a son that lives in DC. He doesn't have the Washington Post delivered to him. He reads it online. So the fact that people can't put their hands on something and read it and go in depth means they don't know anything about some of these things that are really important. So I, I think that, um, you know, those are the things that I think have had a real, real impact. 24-7 cable news, at least five. Newspapers just aren't what they once were. People get, watch the 10 o'clock news and they think they know what's going on. 12 minutes of news. And for, for, for you that want to get involved in politics, you think to yourself, how can I ever afford to do that? Some of you might be thinking about running in Shimkus' seat or something. I don't know. But 30 counties. So um, when Bob Michael ran the first time in 1956, he raised $15,000. The last time he ran in 92, he raised over a million dollars for a congressional race. You get the last question. <laughs> you're very kind, and thank you. We were here 10 years ago, and you're here. Um, there have been two, let's call them technical proposals to improve what you would call maybe the bipartisanship or management of Congress. One has been change the congressional calendar so you might have 10 or 15 days, uh, working days in D.C., than 10 or 15 straight working days in the home district. That's a good suggestion, and that's been suggested many times. The second one, which I, I really doubt is ever going to happen, but I'd like your opinion, um, is that uh, a, a large percentage of the current civilian workforce that's in the federal agencies in D.C. be basically moved back out into the rest of the country. There have been different proposals in terms of how that might work, but half the employment of the Department of Ag or Commerce or Transportation that many of the DOJ would simply go into other field districts and you would move a large number of people out of it. And by the way, I saw this more recently. I think five of the richest counties of the top 10 now surround DC. And so political power does seem to attract economic um, income. So those are the two proposals. Sure. Thanks. And thank you again. Yeah, no, they're both very good suggestions. And, uh, but the bureaucracy in D.C. probably won't let the ha second one happen, but, um, and the suggestion about 10 days of work or 15 days of work and 15 days off, the Senate has tried that, and um, I think it's worked pretty well for them. It's been suggested in the House, and so um, 
I, I don't think it's worked as well uh, for the House as it has for the Senate. And the Senate is much more collegial. There's only 100 senators, and many of those senators do live in Washington. They have their families in Washington, and uh, they don't go back to their state as often as maybe House members do. And there is much more collegiality, I think, in the Senate. Let, let, let me just say um, to each one of you, um, I, I know that each one of you cares a lot about government and politics, or you wouldn't be here tonight. And so I'm grateful to you for being good citizens, interested in what's happening in our country, and interested in uh, some of the things that, uh, where, you know, you're concerned about, about America. And that is really the greatness of our country. And the final thing I will say is, uh, we settle our disputes in America at the ballot box. So, you know, this idea of impeachment or whatever, a year from now, those of you who like Trump will get a chance to vote for him again. Those of you who don't will, will get a chance to vote for someone else. And that is the way that our great country has been so successful and people have tried to replicate it all over the world. We are the envy of the world. We are, because of the way we conduct our elections, because of the way we select people, because of the way that we get involved in our government. And so to each one of you, thank you for coming tonight. But more importantly, thank you for being interested in politics and government and involved, as I know many of you are. That's the greatness of America. Well, Ray, thank you very much for the, a wonderful, wide-ranging, and very candid uh, description of your life and the current circumstances. And uh, again, thank you for all you've done for Peoria and for Illinois. And uh, we look forward to having you come back soon. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you.